Sabbath, everyone. We want to welcome you to our lesson discussion this Sabbath and this morning. And uh, before we start, I will invite my colleague here. In front here, we have uh, the panelists. On my right, we have, uh, you can introduce your name. My name is Sarah Wekesa. Thank you, Sarah. And on my left, we have Thank you. So on my left, we have uh, Victor with us. And my name is Naftal. We want to welcome you to the message in this new quarter as we get it from the book of uh, Hebrews. So before we start, I will invite Sarah to pray for us as we start the lesson. Let us pray. Our eternal Father in heaven, we bless your holy name and worship you. We glorify you, Jehovah, for the new year that you've given unto us. Thank you for having taken care of us through the past year. And Lord, we just want to exalt you and worship you. You are a good God. And this morning we dedicate ourselves to you, ourselves unto you, Jehovah, that your presence will be with us for the rest of this year. And even as we look at your word this morning, even as we discuss the book of Hebrews throughout this quarter, we invite your Holy Spirit to guide us, to minister to us, O oh Lord, and that the word we are going to study will transform us to your own likeness, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Now, um, the title of uh, our new lesson for this quarter says, In These Last Days, the message of Hebrews. In these last days, the message of Hebrews. Now, uh, when we talk about the last days, the books that comes into our mind definitely is the book of Daniel. Mostly, it could be the book of Daniel. We could be talking about the book of Revelation. But also, of course, we do have other books that emphasizes the message of uh, the message relevant in the last days, like the book of Matthew. But today, and also in the course of this week, we have been looking at, in these last days, the message from the perspective of Hebrews. Actually, when you open the book of Hebrews, among the first verses, verses 2 of Hebrews says, hath in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed, heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So in other words, uh, there is also a special message that we can pick from uh, the book of Hebrews, very, very relevant to this particular uh, age. Now, as we go deeper into the discussion, of course, for, for the last uh, few days, for this week, uh, we have been focusing on uh, lesson number one. We have about 13 lessons that talks about the letter to the Hebrews and to us. The letter to the Hebrews and to us. Now, I just want to say first and foremost that uh, this book of Hebrews, of course, there is a dispute uh, as far as who the author is. At the moment, there is consensus that uh, Paul probably, there's a big likelihood that Paul was the author of this book of Hebrews, despite the fact that uh, there is that uh, debate as to whether indeed it was Paul who wrote this book. And it's also uh, good to note that uh, before the canonization of the Bible itself, before the arrangement of the books the way we see it in the New Testament, actually the letter of uh, Hebrews was included amongst the, 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 the letters that uh, were written by Paul. The reason as to why there is a strong feeling 
that uh, this book was written by Paul. So we'll be looking at this message from the dimension of Paul himself. Uh, it is a book that uh, was also disputed as to whether it should be included in the Bible. The book of Hebrews, the book of James, the book of uh, Jude, the book of Revelation, the book of 1st, 2nd, Peter, the f book of Jude, and also the book of 1st to 3rd uh, uh, John, as we see them in the New Testament. However, the issue shouldn't be about authorship. The issue shouldn't be about uh, disputing whether it should be included or not included, but the issue should be the message. If you look at the message, not only in Revelation, but also in this book of uh, Hebrews and also the rest of the other books that uh, cl it's claimed to have been disputed, the message is quite very relevant. The message is quite very authentic. And that is the reason as why we also need to heed what we can learn from these particular books. Now we go straight to our discussion today, today the letter to the Hebrews and to us. And before we go even deeper into this, we have been given a memory text there, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 36. Uh, Victor, you can read for us. Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 36. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to uh, welcome everyone. It's a happy Sabbath and a happy 2022. We look forward for more blessings and more so in this quarter as we study the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 36 says that for you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God you may receive the promise. Thank you. For you have need of endurance. The emphasis there is endurance, perseverance. Now, uh, the author of the lesson is emphasizing uh, three main perspectives as we go through this lesson. The first perspective is the style in which this book, the style in which this letter was written. Is it historical? Is it poetic? What is the style of this particular letter? The second perspective that we're going to be looking at is the audience. In fact, there's quite a big emphasis on the audience of this particular letter. And the lastly but not least, we're going to be looking at um, uh, the relevance of uh, this message to us in these last days. Now, in terms of the style, uh, the, the book itself gives us a clue as to the main intention of this particular letter. When we read um, Hebrews chapter 13, verses um, 22, Paul says that uh, he has written this letter, of course, in few words, as a letter of exhortation, as a letter of exhortation. Exhortation simply means uh, uh, somebody wants to bring out, somebody wants to address a particular issue, somebody wants to emphasize a particular message. And when we go back to Acts, because that word of exhortation is also emphasized, when you look at uh, the book of Acts chapter 13, from verses 15, we're seeing Paul going into the temple. He goes into the synagogues and he sits down. As is the tradition, uh, the books were opened, the books of the prophets, the books of the law were, read, uh, were, were opened, they were read to the congregation. And then Paul is invited and, uh, and, and the way he's invited, he's invited and asked, if at all you have a message of exhortation, take the floor and speak to us. I'm just paraphrasing. So therefore, and when you, when you look at that uh, perspective of uh, Acts, Paul stands up and he starts speaking to the audience in, in Acts chapter 13 from verses uh, 15 
14, 16 there. And therefore, Hebrews, as a mother of conclusion, is a letter of exhortation. And to make it more clearer, it is more of a sermon. It is more of a sermon. And for any sermon, there is an audience. And therefore, uh, from, uh, uh, from, from the day of Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, we are really focusing on this sermon. And uh, to be more clear on this, we want to look at the audience, the audience to this particular sermon. So therefore, I will want us to move straight to uh, the next perspective of our lesson, a glorious beginning. That is on the day of uh, Sunday, unless maybe there is any uh, perspective from my panelists. I want to invite uh, Sarah to take us through the day of Sunday, the, a glorious beginning. As I have said, uh, we want to look at the audience as Paul speaks, as Paul passes his message to the Hebrews in the form of a sermon, he's speaking to a particular audience. And maybe, uh, Sarah, maybe to ask you this question, I want you to tell us uh, the experience of the audience of Hebrews when they were first converted, even as we, you take us through this particular day. Thank you very much. Once again, Happy New Year. We thank God for this privilege of studying this lesson of Hebrews. And as our moderator has ably introduced, it is a letter, it is believed it's a letter or a sermon by Apostle Paul to the Hebrews. And the Hebrews were kind of like us, not exactly, but kind of, because most of them or all of them may not have seen or had Jesus preach physically. But they received the good news of salvation from the people who had heard from Jesus, or first-hand witnesses. And Paul was not also actively there when Jesus was preaching, but he had gotten a revelation from the Lord. And Paul, is speaking to his brethren, the Hebrews. Uh, somebody said that is why he didn't keep introducing himself like he does in his other letters. Like in the other letters, he says, Paul, a servant of God by the will of Jesus Christ. But now that he's speaking to his brethren, the Hebrews, he just starts, they know him, of course, and he just starts his sermon. And the experience of the Hebrews was a special one. Knowing that they had come from the culture of offering sacrifices, and they are getting this new message of salvation, that Jesus came, he was born uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he lived among men, he did many miracles, he preached the good news, and he died on the cross. And he not only died, he rose again, and he lives to intercede. In fact, there is a lot of intercession in the book of Hebrews. And this sermon was, must have been quite interesting to the Hebrews. And they are hearing some wonderful news of Jesus Christ being the Son of God and being the Savior of the world. And when they hear from these people, these people are not only they are not only hearing of people who just preached the word. There is something extra that the Holy Spirit had done. After Jesus' ascension, when he was ascending, he told his disciples not to leave where? Not to leave Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit came upon them. And the Holy Spirit for sure came upon them. And that marked the explosion of the gospel the disciples of Jesus and those people who had been converted started preaching the gospel. And there's one thing, extra thing that happened as they preached the gospel. There, was, uh, mir there were miracles. There were signs. Great things would happen to accompany those sermons. And I want us to, to look 
at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. And I would like my brother Victor to read Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. Um, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, it says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, mm -hmm. which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, mm -hmm. and was confirmed to us by those who had him? Mm -hmm. uh, verse 4. God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Amen. In these two verses, we say that the first preacher of the good news was Jesus Christ. And then the apostles came. And there is a question there. How shall we escape if we ignore such a salvation? If we ignore what Jesus Christ has graciously and so preciously given unto us that we may be saved and not lost. Now, when we look at those miracles that the disciples did. I'm sure the miracles were not just for the sake of being done. And when we look at the book of Mark, when we look at the book of Mark, I want us to look at the book of Mark, chapter 16. Chapter 16, verse 20. Mark, chapter 16, verse 20. It says, mm -hmm. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. Amen. So what was the purpose of this sign? The purpose of these signs and miracles was to confirm the word that they had said. So if at all these apostles went out and just performed miracles, would they have made sense? No. They had to first preach and then the miracles would confirm the word. And we see a lot of miracles being done, for sure. We see Peter raising Dorcas. We see Peter enjoying going, going to the gate called Beautiful and finding this man, lame man who had been sitting there for a long time. And he asked for, some, for arms, for money. And they told him, silver and gold, have we? None. But in whose name? In the name of Jesus rise up and walk. These miracles were not just being performed. They were being performed in the name of Jesus. We see Philip doing so many miracles in Samaria. And we also see Paul himself by the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus performing many miracles. So the, the Hebrews got this message not only through word but through miracles. But I'm asking, I've been asking myself, when we go out, when we give this message, do we see these wondrous signs? Do we see these miracles? Or we just preach and there is no confirmation, like there is no stamping. This message is actually from me and I prove this because this happens. But I would like to say that I thank God that the greatest miracle that can happen in the life of men is accepting Jesus and being transformed to the likeness of God. And I'm sure we see that miracle, but not ignoring these other miracles, we also see people being delivered from demon possession, like it happened during the time of apostles. We see healing because it's the same Holy Spirit who is at work even as we minister today. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that particular perspective. That uh, in the work of uh, salvation, at that time, remember, Hebrews is one of the oldest books written in the Old Testament. In fact, it is ranked top number 10 as far as uh, the books in terms of um, uh, how old the books were. So Hebrews is one of the oldest. Despite the fact that it was one of the oldest, it is a message for the people in the last days. And Paul, when Paul is writing this letter, he is writing when persecution has already occurred. He is writing this letter when the Hebrews, the Jews, 
they're not in Jerusalem. The temple has already been destroyed. So we are talking about a period when uh, the Jews were scattered. And Paul is reminding his audience that uh, when we got this message, when we got it from the first uh, witnesses, from the prophets, and we pass this message to you, of course it came in miracles. It came through uh, the direct message that we listened to from Jesus. The people at that time, the congregation at that time, they were joyous. They, 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 they received it with a lot of joy, with a lot of praise, with a lot of uh, positive uh, uh, vigor with them, with a lot of enthusiasm. And uh, maybe I still want to ask Sarah this uh, uh, particular question that uh, maybe you can give us your experience. When you, were first, when you first confirmed yourself to be a Christian, what was the experience? Was it similar to this particular audience that uh, we are uh, being told here in this particular uh, perspective? Thank you. I want to confess that my experience was not that dramatic. You know, there are these people who give testimonies and they have dramatic testimonies. Mine is not that kind. I was born in an Adventist family. So basically, the word of God was being taught in my home every day and worship was a daily occurrence. And as I grew up, uh, reaching my teenage, around 13, you know, when I was growing up, it's long ago, and mostly we had parents who were either illiterate or semi-illiterate. My mom was illiterate. My father at least could read English and Kiswahili and vernacular. So there was that gap of having children-like material, you know, like you were exposed to very hard stuff when you were young. So basically, there was a lot of confusion in our minds at that time. And reaching teenage, I was not sure if church was really the main thing. But God provided a way. When I cleared my primary school, I went to a school which was Catholic. And those days, schools that were Catholic were like 60%. Uh, Catholic sisters were the teachers. And so the issue of Sabbath came up in my first year in high school. And I had a lot of challenges with the Sabbath. And by the end of the year, I had become like the Hebrews. I had malaise. I was tired of this pushing about Sabbath. And so I was transferred to an Adventist school. And that is where my life started turning around. Uh, I got a different environment, uh, a friendly environment, and the word of God was preached to me at my level. And that is when, in my second year in high school, when I was 15, is when I gave my life to Jesus. That is when I, I realized that I had a personal responsibility, not depending on my parents' salvation, but depending on my, own, on my own choice, choosing to be a Christian. Thank you. So, and, and, and that is the kind of uh, audience that, uh, the first audience that Paul is speaking to, that uh, the experience was joyful. There was not so much persecution, of course. There was not so much uh, challenges as far as, as far as their spiritual walk of life was, was concerned. Now, Paul moves to another audience that is speaking through Hebrews. And this, uh, we're finding it in, on, on, on the day of Monday. This is an audience that uh, is now struggling with persecution. Remember, the book has been written way, way, way after Jesus has, has gone to heaven. Way, way after uh, the apostles have already preached Paul has also preached he is now in prison. So when he's writing this letter, he's also writing a letter reminding the audience about the second phase 
or persecution. And uh, Victor is going to be helping us on this. Remember, for those who are just joining us uh, online and also at this particular moment in the auditorium, we are learning about the book of Hebrews. And to be more specific, the style in which this book is written, it is more of a sermon. And uh, this sermon is not written in Hebrew, despite the fact that the letter is to the Hebrews. It is l written in Greek. Remember, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. But in, in the New Testament, the language is in Greek, despite the fact that uh, the superpower by that time was Romans, and the main language by then was the Latin. But the Greeks had already an impact. So, so, so Greek was a uh, was, uh, was, uh, was, uh, was, uh, was language that was commonly used. So Paul is speaking in a language, of course, that is uh, common to the people, to the world at that particular time, written to the Hebrews, but in Greek, meaning that anybody in the world, be it in Rome, be it in Egypt, be it in, 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 in Jerusalem, can easily be able to understand this particular letter. And he's reminding them that we have gone through phases. The first phase was when you received this message of salvation and the experience was good. The second phase is the phase of persecution, the phase of struggle. So maybe, Victor, you can try to help us uh, the kind of experience through this particular uh, phase. What was the experience of the audience on this particular phase? Um, thank you so much. When I, I look at uh, um, the, the, the beginning, you see, we are told that uh, it's a glorious beginning. But then now, you know, it turns to something different, the opposite. It is now a struggle. And, uh, you know, we are told that the Christian life is a battle, it's a warfare. And um, we will have to fight. And uh, as we are challenged, that there are those who will endure uh, to the end. And the promise will be theirs from uh, the key text that we read. And I want to also um, uh, relate to um, Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, verse 32 to 34, and it says that, but recall the former days in which after you were eliminated, you endured a great struggle with suffering. So when they received the message, they did not remain the same. They were eliminated. They were positively impacted by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hence, they were eliminated and they endured a great struggle with sufferings. 33 says that partly while you were made a spectacle, uh, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. And 34, for you had compassion on me in my chains and joyfully accepted the plunderings of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. So there is persecution that they are going through. Life is not sweet. It's bittersweet for them. But I like them because they are not giving up. They are not giving up the hope that they have. And therefore, I learn from, uh, what I learned from Hebrews here uh, and from Paul is that you know, there is that endurance that is expected from us, just like we expect the fight not to be on our side or in our favor. There will be a fight of afflictions and conflicts will always take place. Number two, um, you know, they even lost their material possessions, getting even to be chains. So the material possessions that they had, they lost, but they lost it for a better reward that they were looking forward to. Yes, the material possessions are very important in the ministry because this is what we use to even uh, propel the gospel. This is what we use so that we can uh, support the mission that we have been called unto. And at the same time, we are challenged that when we get uh, to receive the message of Christ, we must accept to let go of the worldly things. We have to let the worldly things be secondary, and then those around us will realize 
how important it is to stand for Christ. I know it will be about persecution. I know it will be very difficult for us, just like it wasn't easy for them with the tribulations, um, uh, with even getting chains. But they joyfully accepted the plunderings. And that's why when you look at even Paul himself with Silas, when they are arranged in courts, they were joyfully singing songs of praise and worship to God. And at the end of it, they, um, they were released from jail, you know, in a miraculous manner. And therefore, um, the message we find here is very illuminating and is very encouraging and giving us hope, even owing to the fact that we are in the new year that uh, we are having the hope of winning the battles if we give ourselves to Christ. And let me also link it up to Moses, because Moses says... Maybe before, in, uh, before, oh, sorry. before, thank you. Okay. Before you go to Moses and, um, and also Peter, yes. because we may really want to understand what lesson can we learn, especially from the perspective of Moses and, and Peter, as you prepare for that, uh, we want to thank uh, the online viewers for their comments. I uh, want to recognize the comment by Tom, who has just said that indeed conversion is a glorious happening and the struggles that follows are not surprising. So therefore, uh, and, 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 I, and I think that is uh, in agreement with what we've just seen, that uh, when you undergo through the first conversion as a Christian, it is a glorious thing. And Paul is reminding his audience, but now what about the second phase? that uh, of struggle, the second phase of uh, persecution. Uh, and um, as we look at, um, at, at, at that, and uh, Victor is going to be, uh, to be helping us uh, on that, I also want to appreciate uh, the comments by Rodney Smith, our online viewer. The book of Hebrews seeks to compare the contrast between chapter one and, uh, and two. Jesus being equal to God and Jesus being equal uh, to man. Thank you very much. Remember, the focus still here is on Jesus. As you receive this uh, message of, uh, of Christ, they are phases that we are likely to undergo and we are in the second phase. So uh, Victor has uh, really pointed out the aspect of the struggle the aspect of the persecution that uh, even the early church believers were undergoing. So maybe in one minute, Victor, what advice is Moses and Peter giving us when we are faced with persecution? Um, we will be faced with persecution. And in fact, if you have not, you just have to be ready. Uh, because... Um, um, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 24 says that by faith Moses when he became of age refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. So he made a tough choice to suffer affliction but with the people of God and we are told that Moses today is sitting on the right hand side of God and is enjoying the pleasures and the riches in heaven. So it's better for us to sacrifice and suffer afflictions than to enjoy the pleasures and riches of this life, but have the assurance that there is the best that is awaiting us in the heavenly kingdom. Thank you. Thank you for that. Now, that brings us once again to our memory verse. Remember, our memory verse, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 36 says... For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Now, indeed, the Christians, the Hebrews in the early church, they not only received the message joyfully when they received it, they indeed succeeded in going through the persecution and they were really strengthened despite the fact that uh, the persecution was severe they were the, 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 the body of Christ the Christians actually they increased in numbers so in other words they, in, they endured that there was the last suf uh, suffering that, uh, or challenges that actually also came in 
to the third audience that uh, Paul is again speaking to, and that is the audience of malice. There is, we have gone through all this. Now, maybe, Sarah, you can help us to really understand the challenges that uh, this particular audience was uh, going through and, if possible, maybe what lessons or uh, what advice we can pick from them. Okay, thank you. Uh, we see that these Christians had gone through a lot of suffering and they had endured for long and even some of them were still in prison. So they had this feeling of malaise, discomfort, you know, unhappiness. I mean, this thing is taking so long. Eh? They were getting victory after victory, but still they got tired. And we see Paul encouraging them, exhorting them. Like in Hebrews 2 verse 18, Paul gives them an assurance that Jesus is still their help. And in Hebrews 12 verse 3, he tells them to consider Jesus. If they consider Jesus, they will not give up. And this is not strange. It is not a strange occurrence to the Hebrews only. Because in the Bible, we see somebody who went through such a thing. After God had given him victory, he went through some depression. And this person knows Elijah. You remember in the book of First Kings, because of time we won't read, chapter 19 is the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal at Carmel. When he had summoned the prophets of Baal, numbering 450 of them, and he was all alone standing for Jehovah. And he challenged them to a contest. And we know that at the end, what happened? He won the contest. And the whole of Israel, including King Ahab, saw that actually God is God and Baal is nothing. And with that victory, he had this comfort and confidence. Now that they have seen, for sure, all of them will believe it. And so there will be no more persecution. You know, he's up there on the mountain. And then something unexpected happens. Jezebel threatens him. And what does he do? Elijah runs away and goes to hide. And he's so depressed and he even tells God, Oh God, I am actually through with you. I just want to die. And then God appears through an angel and he wakes him up. Wake up and eat. And that was a sign. It was like God saying, yes, you are through with me, but I'm not through with you. I still have some business with you. And there are lessons we can learn from Elijah. Number one, it is that it is possible to forget that the God who has given us victory will sustain us. And we see Elijah saying, I am the only one and I would rather die. It's like he had forgotten the same God who had given him victory was able to protect him from Jezebel. And there's another lesson we see that many times we lose hold of God and imagine, and imagine that our plans are better. Elijah thought that the plan of running away was the best plan. And there are times that we, we decide that our plans are better. And then number three, the last one, we see a God who chases after us. Even when we are so depressed, when we are giving up, God doesn't give up. And God follows Elijah and provides for him and tells him, you have more business with me to do. So these three lessons to me, of course there are many more lessons, but these are the lessons that I got. Thank you very much. So we are seeing an audience in uh, the Malays, an audience that is almost giving up, like what Elijah, uh, Elijah's experience is. They're giving up. We have gone through persecution. Yes. We have gone through all these forms of challenges. Enough is enough. And uh, for Elijah, indeed, he gave up. But we are picking a, a strong lesson there that God didn't give up. God didn't give up as far as Elijah was concerned uh, on his life. The same with us, that God is still with us. God is not giving up on us, despite the fact that um, we are facing all those uh, diverse challenges. 
that we face in life. Now we are coming to the conclusion of uh, this lesson and uh, there are two more lessons that we can pick from this book of Hebrews. Press together. Press together. What is Paul speaking to us through uh, this book of Hebrews as far as um, press together is concerned, Victor? Um, thank you. I also want to pick it from Elijah's experience. And um, after he's threatened, he runs away. But I like the way that God is approaching Elijah. He reaches out to him at the cave through the, uh, the doves and feeds him. Then allows him to have a rest. And after having the rest, that's when God now talks to him again, reaches out to him and tells him to go, that he has a heavy message to carry out there. And you see, this is Elijah that uh, has won a very serious battle. And, and I see how wise God deals with those who are straying away and bringing them back into the fold. I am seeing a very important rest in our lives, just like Sabbath rest. Elijah takes a rest, gets to be rejuvenated, and is now ready to even fight more battles that were ahead of him. And I also find that God provides for our needs. And when he provides for our needs, let us also remember to provide for the needs of our neighbors and for the needs of the rest. At the same time, I also learned that we must be prepared to be rebuked and receive instructions in times when we need it, like Elijah's case. God rebuked him, but at the right time. And uh, second last, God wants us to grow from all levels of our character developments. You know, Elijah is now moving from milk and is getting introduced to meat. So we must move, we must be ready as God's children to move from one level to a higher level, though the experience may not be that smooth. And finally, we are never alone. Elijah was not alone. He is told that you are not only two, because to him he had seen that he is alone. But we are told that you have got not only one or two, but 7,000 um, uh, patients and um, faithful Christians who did not kneel and bow down for Baal prophets. And that's you. what I would add. Thank there. you. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, the last aspect of the, of the lesson, the last days. Yes, Sarah, what lessons can we pick from this book of Hebrews uh, as far as uh, these last days are concerned? Thank you. The, the Bible, the book of Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1 to verse 2 uh, says that God is speaking to us through his son in these last days. In the past, he, he spoke to the prophet. So the fact that Jesus is the one speaking to us now shows we are living in the last days. And there, there, there is a, uh, a comparison or parallel between the children of Israel at the bank of the promised land and us who are also at the banks of the promised land, like girl, we are about to get home. And the children of Israel, there are some things that happened. When Moses saw the promised land was closed, he sent spies. And there were 12 spies. And 10 of them brought a bad report. The other two, Joshua and Caleb, brought a good report. And when they brought the good report, of course, the, the children of Israel doubted because they believed the report of the other ten. And in this case, we see doubt cropping up among the children of Israel. And the parallel is, this, is that during these last days, there is a possibility that we shall doubt God. We shall doubt even his promises, especially in these last days when persecution will come and things that we don't expect will come our way. We may doubt God like the children of Israel did. And then there is something else that happened. There was rebellion. These people rebelled against God. And out of that rebellion, God was not happy. And is there a possibility that we are rebelling? There is a lot of rebellion now against God, even against authorities. Uh, there is general feeling that the authorities are not right, even the leadership that has been put by God in the church. And there is rebellion also, just like the children of Israel rebelled against Moses. And then there was, 
in Numbers chapter 23, 24, 24 and 25, there was the scene of sexual immorality that the, the Israelites went out to the Moabites and there is this example of Zimri who went and got a woman from the Moabites and brought him to the camp while Moses and the rest of the leaders were watching. And this sexual immorality is also real in the last days, even in the church. And God is telling us that these are the last days, yes, but I, he still expects us to trust in him, just like he expected the children of Israel to trust in him. He had done many miracles for them, just like he has done for us. We have no reason to doubt God. We have no reason to deviate and leave his ways. All we have to do is follow him to the end, because he's a faithful leader who will lead us to our heavenly home. Thank you very much. He's a faithful God and he's expecting us to trust him. So I want to thank you all for your listening ears. I want to thank you all, especially the online viewers, for those who have participated in giving comments, encouraging comments here and there. And uh, this brings us to the end of our lesson. Remember, as we come to the end, we have learned that uh, in the book of Hebrews, Paul is writing a letter in the form of a sermon and is writing a letter to an audience that has gone through different phases of life as far as their Christian walk of life is concerned. And to sum it up, Paul is encouraging them in the memory text, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. It is also an encouragement to us. We might be going through various challenges in these last days. It could be the challenge of COVID. It could be the challenge of finances. It could be the challenge of relationship. All, name them, all the various challenges. We are being encouraged. Can we endure? God is still there. God is still in control in our lives. Um, I will request us to bow down as we have our final prayer. Let's pray. Our loving Father in heaven, we want to thank you in a very special way for the message that you are passing to us through this book of Hebrews. Thank you for reminding us that uh, despite the challenges we face in life, it could be the challenges of diseases. It could be the challenges of finances. It could be ch the, the challenges of relationships. It could be the challenges as far as our, 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 our walk of faith is concerned. Lord, you have reminded us through Paul that we still need that spirit of endurance. Give us this courage. Give us the spirit to be able to not only apply the lessons we have learned from these lessons in our lives, but also give us the spirit to be able to be faithful to you. Forgive us our sins and bless us even as we continue fellowshipping and worshipping you today, for we pray this believing and trusting in Jesus' name. Thank you.